in every industry, in every country I've been in, for me, the quickest route to market has always been to collaborate with strategic partners. I think the biggest miss that people make in Thank terms of so selling it, yeah. it's about how does somebody do something big in a very short period of time? Guys, I am super excited to introduce our next amazing, amazing, amazing person, the leader in the world when it comes to strategic partnerships and joint venturing, which is one of the highest value tasks in a business, is the companies that you align with. And this is what he does as an expert on Clubhouse. He's one of the biggest accounts on Clubhouse, the JV expert. Uh, so if you've been on Clubhouse, you've very likely seen him there. So Hill, thank you so much for taking the time. I'm excited to dive into strategic alliances. My question for you is just kind of like a zoomed out uh, do's and don'ts about strategic alliances in business. Good question. Um, first of all, a lot of people ask me, how do I go about creating a strategic alliance and how do I go about finding a strategic partnership? So the first thing, and I'll give you a nutshell how it basically works. Uh, one thing that you need to do, first of all, is identify your ideal customer avatar. Who is that? Uh, what does that makeup look like in terms of the customer that you're, uh, that you're targeting? Second of all, you need to redefine and define your customer audience. So what's the customer audience that you're after? And then what you need to do is go and look for someone who has access or control of that customer audience. Now, what you need to do next is build relationship and rapport with that individual person who controls that customer audience and build a relationship with them, in turn, getting them to endorse you to their customer audience. So this, for me, has always been the quickest route to market. Everything I've ever done, including on Clubhouse, is all about collaboration. I can spend <clears throat> months, uh, years trying to get to my target market or build out my target market. But why do that when somebody else already has access to that target market and that customer audience? The great thing is this. You spend a lot of money on marketing, um, um, uh, failing and succeeding, trying to figure out the exact target market. And the thing with that is there'll be a lot of wastage. Because as you know, a lot of people spend money on lead gen, especially Facebook, for example. If you go to any Facebook expert, you will know how much money they spend on Facebook marketing. And they get leads, but there's a lot of wasted leads as well. There's a lot of leads that aren't their customer audience. But what if you went to someone who had that exact customer audience, that exact customer avatar that you're looking for, instead of spending any money on marketing advertising, you get them to endorse you to their customer audience. So the thing is, no cost up front, no risk, absolutely no risk. You only pay out on sales. So when that strategic partner makes the sales, you only pay on each sale that's made. So that's why it's like a zero risk and it's one of the quickest routes to market. And in every industry, in every country I've been in, for me, the quickest route to market has always been to collaborate with strategic partners. So I hope that helps. Wow. So there's two, there's two questions coming to mind. And you know, for, for people who are looking for sources to their target market, people who've already won the trust of the target markets, they can tap into that. The first question that pops in my mind is building trust with that strategic alliance, that company, the person with the list. <coughs> what, are, what Like, how do you do that? Because to me, that, that seems very straight. If it's like an established brand, mm -hmm. why would how much due diligence would they have to do it in, in a company like you before they would really open the floodgates on it? How do you build? That's a good, that's a good question. To, to, to build trust, you have to do something for that individual or that company. You have to show them that you have something that can really help them. Also, gaps in market. Some companies, they'll offer certain products to their audience, but they won't have a whole foray of products. If you can show them a way, and we call it a win-win-win, right? A win for you, a win for them, but overall, a win for their customers. That's the biggest thing. If you can show how it's going to impact their customers and make them the hero, right? Those are the two things that you really need to look at precisely. And if you can achieve that, then you'll get strategic partners lining up at your door because they would want to, first of all, have a win for themselves. And they'll also want to be the hero for their customers. Now, one of the biggest things that I saw a gap in the market during the pandemic was this exact scenario. A lot of companies are going bust. They don't have the money to acquire new customers. But what about existing customers? Existing customers who are buying products for them from them that they don't supply anymore, 
instead of going bust, why don't you create a strategic alliance with somebody else who has a similar complementary product that you can go back and you can give to your customers because you have that relationship, you have that lifetime customer value with those customers. Those customers have already spent money with you. There is already trust and authority there. And so it's easy for you to say, hey, I know we're not going in this direction because we can't supply that product anymore, but guess what? We can supply these products to you. So that is one of the biggest gaps in the market that I saw that everyone goes for customer acquisition, but not many people go for customer retention. So this is the biggest gap in the market that I've seen. And customers who have bought from you once will buy from you again, again, and again, and again. There is cash flow there. So the, I'm a big proponent of this. And I always tell my brokers and my consultants, <coughs> money flows from A to B, right? It's a, it's, it's a flow. If you can disrupt that flow and get in the middle of that transaction, you're always guaranteed to make money because where money flows, money goes, right? So if you can get in the middle of a transaction, that's why I always say work with companies that are already making money. Because if you work with companies that are already making money, you are guaranteed to be in that conduit between the transference of money and actually make money. So I always advise that to my consultants and brokers that when you work with clients, make sure that they're making money because if they're making money you just have to be the broker in between those deals and come in between that flow of money and that money will flow through you and that's how you're guaranteed that you will always make money on deals and with those clients so hope that helps. wow yeah so um i mean there's a science to the flow of money uh just like there's a science to the operations of a business like karen just went through this is amazing so the next question is regarding risk and reward. Um, so I, I look at going all in on strategic partnerships as a potential huge upside if it works out, but the risk is that you neglect the transactional marketing activities that are keeping quote unquote bread on the table, right? So yep. how do you conceptualize <clears throat> the risk and reward? Like, should you not over commit to forming strategic alliances? Should you have a certain quantity of prospects before you do it so that you're not let down if one doesn't work? This really depends on your route to market and the outcome that you want in terms of your business. If you're looking to basically make a big leap in a marketplace and, um, uh, uh, and penetrate a marketplace that you don't specifically know, that's where you can go all in with strategic partners because that gets you to your route to market quickly. If you already have current transactions, Strategic partnerships and affiliates marketing should always be a part of your your revenue model and your income model. So I would always say balance it if it's an easier thing to do. There is, I would say there is no real big risk. There is more of a risk of spending money on Facebook ads than there is with strategic partnerships because it doesn't cost you anything up front. So we've got to try and take that risk element out. Uh, and say, look, you've also got to be precise in terms of who are the strategic partnerships you want to work with. One of the other things is something called the Dream 100, okay? Um, which means that you create a list of those Dream 100 clients or partners that you want to work with. And if you can uh, focus your energy just on that Dream 100, because they're already making money. So like I've said, if someone's already making money and you can get into that uh, a conduit, into that flow, you're guaranteed to make money. So yeah, I would say to reduce your risk, Go for that dream 100 and focus on that dream 100. That way you're first thing, focusing your energies on what I call uh, IGAs, income generating activities, because these companies, if you get a strategic partnership with them, they'll skyrocket you to the moon. So that's one of the ways I would say to start off focusing when you're uh, looking at doing strategic partnerships. Wow. So another question relates to the very big epiphany that you gave me regarding non-competing, no threat. I love this. I love this. Okay. So yeah, let me, let me explain. Cause this insight was huge. If there is an inkling of whoever you're going to potentially join forces with, if there's an inkling of competition or if they do, or if they could reasonably offer the service that you offer, but they don't really push it. There's some unconscious factor there that makes it less healthy of a relationship. So you opened my mind to finding non-competing, no threat at all relationships. So with that context, tell us about that. Okay, so this is the thing I say, right? There is really no competition. I call it co-opetition because um, you as an individual, whether you're a consultant or whether you're marketing or whether you're a thought leader, guru, 
or whether you have a particular product or service will always be unique to the market. And you can basically collaborate with other people who are not in are indirect. They still may be competitors, but they're indirect competitors, as in they supply the same market, but they don't supply the exact same product or service because they're only good at doing one thing and you're good at doing another thing. There's an opportunity for you to collaborate and work together in the same marketplace. Now, I'll give you an example of this, right? We used to uh, sell e-learning, online training, right? Online courses. And um, we were the only company that used to approach other um, e-learning companies, not e-learning, uh, computer training companies who were classroom-based and said, hey, you guys are obviously going to get a lot of leads. You get a lot of people who approach you. You must have people who say to you, um, we're looking for only online training. And you say, oh, well, sorry, we don't do that. We just do classroom-based training. So I said, why don't we form a strategic partnership for those people who come to us for classroom-based training, we're happy to promote you or we're happy to give you those leads. If you have any leads for online training in the same industry we're in, in the, in the same, it was exactly the same market and same industry. Those people are not going to buy classroom-based training because that's not what they want. So we can supply the online and then we'll give you the classroom-based leads or we'll give you the classroom-based opportunities and let's work in a partnership. And it was work like gangbusters. So that is another opportunity where you can look at competitors and say, hang on a minute, you're in the, we're in the same space. Actually, we provide the same product. But the difference is you do it a different way from what people want and we do it a different way. So we can still work together and give each other business and uh, reciprocate and form that partnership. So that for me was an, uh, also an epiphany because I was like, no one was doing that in the industry. People see each other as competitors and say, no, we're not gonna work with them because they're competitors. Don't tell them nothing. Don't tell them what we do. Don't talk to them. But we were like, you know what? Let's go and find as many competitors as we can that aren't offering online computer training who just have classroom-based training um, uh, um, locations and let's go for it. My my kind of final question here is getting someone's attention who's already business because the, the the businesses that you would reach out to are already doing well because you'd want to work Correct. with a, you know, a good business and th therefore they won't necessarily need the relationship. So can you give us a example of or some principles in in a, in a script of an example of something that would get someone like a CEO like you or me to drop what they're doing with the, all the ongoing priorities and challenges of a, of a healthy business and drop what they're doing and go, what? Huh? I, I should really look at this. Like what's a lot this? Of this yeah, a lot of this comes down to the approach. Now, the way we do it is we use a third party approach. So for example, I would be the person going in on behalf of my client, for example. And we're, we basically outline the strategy in terms of we can help them 10x or 100x uh, an asset that they already have. And we can help them leverage the asset. What is the asset? It's normally the customer database. But we don't mention that on, on the first trial, the first call. We give them an indication. We use what is called direct response marketing. Uh, you know, I'm a big fan of Dan Kennedy. And what you want to do is you want to to basically get them to raise their hands to have that uh, have that conversation with you and how you do that by intrigue you have to create that intrigue in your message or your script to let them know that look we can show you a way to 10x or 100x an asset that you already have so one of my propositions when I used to go and do this was I used to say this this was my script if I can show you a way to increase uh, to uh, to create a new uh, no to create an additional revenue stream without increasing your overhead, would you be interested? So that was my script. Yeah, if I can show you how to uh, create an additional revenue stream without increasing your overhead, would you be interested? And everyone's answer to that would be yes. Then they would ask me, okay, come and talk to us. Tell us how you can achieve this. And then it's my turn to say, okay, it's called a joint venture or it's called a strategic partnership. Here is how it works. So that's always, that was always my opening gambit when I used to contact companies, whether it's by email, whether it's by phone, was how, if I can show you how to create an additional revenue stream or an additional income stream without increasing your overhead, would you be interested? And most people would say yes, because they want to find out how is this possible?